All right, so we're going to be wrapping up this week uh, tonight with my, my series that I started. I do in six things that God hates. And we'll just review those real quickly. You can keep your finger there in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. We're going to be there in just a minute. But in Proverbs chapter 6, which is ironically where we're at this week in our Bible study, so we're not going to really go into this too much in depth since I've taken six weeks to go through uh, these, very, these six things that the Lord hates. But I'll just read that verse one more time for you in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number uh, 16. The Bible reads, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So notice it said that there's six things the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination, it lists seven things, but lying is mentioned twice, basically bearing false witness and telling lies. So I covered that already when we went um, into that, which is why we're skipping ahead now to he that soweth discord among brethren. That's going to be the focus tonight and figuring out what does that mean and recognizing that God hates those that sow discord among brethren. You think of just the word discord itself is the opposite of discord is accord. So when you see that the disciples were all together in one place and one accord, they were they were they had unity. They were they were like-minded. They had the same, you know, they were in agreement. And discord is the opposite of that. Discord is when there's disagreements and when there's strifes and, and divisions going on within the church. And this is saying specifically, you know, a person that sows discord among brethren. So you've got brethren, you've got believers, you've got, you've got this group of people that congregate together. They love the Lord. And the Bible teaches that, you know, within the local church, within, within the local assembly, that we ought to be unified. Now, everybody obviously isn't entitled to having their own beliefs, and, and I wouldn't expect to get, when you get enough people together, just every single person is always going to agree on absolutely everything. You know, we're not going to have that, but see, there's a difference between just something like that, like just, well, just make a checklist, and you better agree with all this stuff. No, but being in general agreement of, hey, we've got the core down. We've got the fundamentals down. We've got salvation down. We've got, you know, we all want to work together. We all want to serve the Lord. We all want to preach the gospel. We want to do these things, and we're together in one place with one accord. And then when someone comes along and tries to sow discord, meaning they're planting these seeds, trying to pit people against each other, trying to pit the brethren against each other. There's various means that you can do that. You can go after people personally and try to make personal attacks and get people fighting amongst each other. You could go through and bring in heresies and bring in false doctrines. And, and we're going you know, to get into a lot of these different ways that, that discord can be sown among the brethren. But the Bible says that God hates that. And I think the reason why God hates that so much is because this is his body. You know, this is supposed to be the body of Jesus Christ, and we're all members in particular. And we saw that when we went through 1 Corinthians, how we all have different functions. We all have a different role. We all have a different job to play. But ultimately, the main goal is to be doing the will of the Lord and getting people saved and reaching the lost and reaching other people and gathering disciples. I mean, that's the main goal of the church. So when you have a body divided and we have this inner fighting, that's going to seriously hamper the work that you can do. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to really damage what the, the amount of good that you can do and, and, um, as, as a church as a whole. So the person that comes in to sow that discord, God hates that. I mean, that's one of the six things that says God says he hates those things. And there's some pre pretty serious sins that we saw earlier, and we need to make sure that that we recognize this for being as wicked as it is. Now, we haven't had to deal with this yet, but just to warn you, it may happen, it, it will happen one day, someone may come in here and try to spread heresies and try to cause division, and as soon as I catch it, I'm going to snap on that person and they're going to be out of here. So right now, since it hasn't happened yet, if you see somebody like, whoa, Pastor Burson, what? why is he getting so upset about this? Hopefully, at the end of this sermon, you'll realize why I would get so upset for someone that's going to come in and try to cause division among our church. 
and try to get people pitted against each other, or pitted against the pastor, or whatever the case may be, you know, just, just sowing this discord so that we're not in unity anymore. It's a serious sin. There's many ways for a person to sow discord. Um, one way here is for a person to be a whisperer. I'll read for you. You're, stay in 2 Corinthians 12. We're going to be there in just a minute. In Proverbs 16, verse number 27, the Bible reads, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a, as a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Someone who's a whisperer. You say, what's a whisperer? We always say, well, when you whisper to someone, what do you do when you're telling secrets? Right? You're speaking things that you don't want everybody to hear. And what it's designed to do here, what we, could get, what we can gain from the context, a forward man that sows strife, that's someone who's going around and telling secrets about other people that you ought not to be speaking in the first place and just saying, hey, did you know, did you know so and so is, is doing this? Did you see so and so? Look at that person like that. And, and just getting the rumor started, getting the little whispering started, getting people talking within the church and starting to form these factions. And I'll tell you what, we're a small church now, so like, there's only one faction because <laughs> there's so few people, so you can't have like these, these people all, all pitted against each other where we're at right now. But keep it in mind because we are growing and we're continuing to grow. And, and I fully believe that God is going to build this church and that we will, we will be significantly larger even within a year. I, I'm hoping that we're going to double in size. Amen. And, and I believe that to be possible. And that's the vision that I have for this church. And again, you know, that's not huge. But it starts to get enough people to where, you know, we need to be on the lookout for, for the whisperers and for people who are just going to be start spreading rumors because Satan's going to want nothing more than to destroy this church before it ever really fully gets on the ground and starts turning things upside down. I mean, we're doing a great work now. But again, as far as the vision goes for this church, I, the book of Acts is my favorite book for a very good reason. I want to be have that same spirit upon us to where people could say, hey, that Word of Truth Baptist Church, they're really turning things upside down in Prescott Valley and in the whole Prescott area. They're really going through and making a difference and getting people to talk about, about what they believe and, and really bringing a, the, the Word of God and shining that light brightly Amen. in this town. And that's my vision for this. So Satan wants nothing more than to silence that and to, and to quit that. So one of, the way, one of his tools of doing that is splitting churches up and getting people divided. Now, we also live in an area where that has happened already. In the, the two and a half short years that we've been here, I've heard of two independent fundamental Baptist churches that have already closed their doors. And one of them, specifically, I know for sure, they had already suffered a church split and really decimated that church. Now, I don't know any of the specifics or details of it, but here's a place where it's happening. And it has happened very, very recently, so we need to be on the lookout for this. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start looking there again at verse number 19. See, there was a lot of problems at the church of Corinth, and Paul wrote his two epistles, and when you start reading through it, he's like, man, he's just laying, laying out all kinds of things that they were needing to fix and that they were having issues with. And he brings this up, these whisperings and stripes and backbitings. We'll start looking at verse number 19. Sarah, go sit down. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. So he's basically saying, look, when I come to you, I don't want to find all these things. You know, I don't want, I don't want to have to come and all of a sudden I show up and there's all these debates and envyings and wrath and all of these problems going on within the church saying, you got to get everything fixed so that this doesn't happen when I come there. So that there's not these strife. Strife is fighting. Backbitings. 
And, I, and look, backbiting is a serious sin. And that, you know, you say, I don't know what backbiting means. Well, think about the word back. I mean, you're talking about someone behind their back. You're saying nasty, negative things and tearing people down behind their back. That's what backbiting is. And there's no place for that in this church. Amen. If you have a problem with anybody individually, you go take it up with that person or else don't talk about it at all. If you have a problem with some other person in this church, don't go start talking about that problem with some other member and start talking bad about other church members. You deal with it specifically. If it's that big of a problem, if it's not that big of a problem, then shut your mouth. Right. There is no place for backbiting. It's only going to cause division and strife and bitterness to swell in your soul. You, either, you need to be able to learn to just, if someone wrongs you, learn how to forgive that person. And if you're having a problem with it, confront them. And just deal with it. It's way better to get the problems out in the open just between yourselves before it becomes any festering, backbiting type of a problem. But this is one of the things that happens is this backbiting and the whispering and the rumor spreading and the telling of secrets that God hates. It sows strife. It sows discord. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pit people against each other. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. Now, people that, that do this, the people who are involved in sowing discord among the brethren, usually they're being real subtle about it, and they're doing it in guile. Yeah. People are kind of sneaky about doing that. And they're, they're, again, it's the whispering, because they don't want it to be out in the open. They're going to go behind the scenes. They're going to approach one or two people. They're going to they're talk to them and just, and just get that little seed that they're sowing out there so that it starts to sprout up and become a much bigger problem. They're sowing that discord. They're sowing the fighting and the striving in guile and in deceit. They're tail bearers. Now, I'll mention this too. When you're talking about someone, it doesn't matter whether you're lying or whether you're telling the truth. If there's no reason to be talking bad about other people within the church, even if what you're saying is true. Now, there are instances where Sin needs to be confronted by the church. And we go over that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, where we go through all of the instances of, you know, not to have fellowship, not to even eat with someone who's a drunkard or a railer or, you know, all the, the extortioner, right? All the various sins that someone could get involved in where he's saying, you know what, you need to break fellowship over this. There are certain issues like that that, you know what, yeah, that needs to be brought before the church, but... Bring it before the church then. You know, bring it to me. Don't bring it, don't just start talking about the people among yourself. That's not going to solve anything. It's only going to cause more problems. Look at verse number 20 of Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26, starting in verse number 20. The Bible reads, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. So he's saying, you know what? Just as in a fire, hey, when you stop throwing wood in the fire, the fire is going to burn out. It's going to be gone. When you get rid of the person who's telling tales, the storyteller, the one that's telling you about everybody else's business, the problem stops. The fighting stops. The strife ceaseth. We don't need the tail bearer. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. The person who's going around and, and telling their tales and just, just gossiping, and that's what it really is, it's gossip. Now, anybody can be guilty of this, but let's face it, there's a much higher propensity of this happening among the women. It's just part of the way that they were designed. Women have more of a tendency to talk about things and, and get into this. So women, make sure you are definitely keeping yourself right on this and, and not getting involved in just talking about what anyone else is doing, especially, especially when it's something that's, that's just not good about a person. You know, I mean, we're just talking about negative things and bad things about someone. Look, we're all sinners. And I know you would not want 
a big light shine down on every aspect of your life and having everyone else in church talking about all the things that you do that don't quite measure up. I don't think anybody wants that. So keep that in mind the next time you see someone. Oh, I went over this person's house. Man, they've got this DVD collection. They watch these movies. I can't believe they even have that in their house. And just start talking, you know, what's the point? What's the point? And pick the sin. I mean, whatever it may be. I don't know. There's no reason to be talking to people like that. Maybe someone's a closet smoker. Maybe someone goes home and they smoke cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes is a sin. Yeah, it's a sin. That's something they got to deal with. It's nothing that you need to go around and start and spray. Did you know that so-and-so smoked? Hey, did you know that they're doing this? Let me ask you this. What good is that going to do for anybody? It's not going to do the person who's smoking any good. Is that doing you any good by going and telling other people? Is that doing them any good that you, they know that this person's in this sin that you just found out about? All it's going to do is just cause problems. It cause people, oh wow, this person, you know, and start you look, make you think different about other people when there's no need for that. The words of a talebearer has wounds. It's like, I mean, you're, it's like you're hurting somebody when you go around and just start telling tales about people. And what's even worse is when it's just rumor anyways. And it's secondhand. And you're just hearing this from someone else. It's not something that you didn't even see. And you're just going and spreading something that someone else said. Hey, you know what? You know how bad this is? I mean, think about, we'll go to an extreme example here. It's like the men that get accused of rape or a man that gets accused of child molestation or something. You know what happens when that person gets accused, but they're innocent? Everybody thinks that person's guilty anyways. And what happens when people start spreading this rumor, start repeating, you know, well, I, I heard that so-and-so did this. I heard that so-and-so did that. And it tarnishes and ruins their reputation and their, and, and their image, who they are. Now, obviously, if someone is guilty of doing a crime like that, yeah, there's no problem with letting people know there's a predator, there's a pervert out there that, that does these things. Okay. That does need to come to light. That does need to come to the surface. But just a rumor, just a, I think I might have heard somebody said this, there's no reason to be spreading that kind of stuff. It actually does damage to people. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23, burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Isn't that kind of interesting how we just are reading there's seven, six things that God hate, yea, seven are abomination to him? And it's saying here, it's talking about him dissembling with his lips, sowing discord. Dissembling is, is di you know, think of assembling something or dissembling something. He's breaking it down. He's breaking it apart with his lips, with the words that he's using. He's breaking people apart, layeth up deceit within him, and he's lying about it. So there's two of the, the, the six things that God hates already right there. It says there's seven abominations in his heart, verse 26, whose hatred is covered by deceit. So the fact that he has hatred in his heart, he covers it up by, with deceit, by just lying about it, by, by coming off with an image that is false, that is, that is different than what's actually in his heart. He covers up the fact that he's hating people and lying about them, whatever else. It's a person who, who's spreading rumors about, about someone else, and then when they're face-to-face -face with them, it's, oh, how are you doing? And you're so friendly and you love them. It's being two-faced. And you're, you're dissembling, you're, you're, excuse me, you're um, covering your hatred with deceit as if you actually care about that person and, what, and what the, how they're doing when you're then turning around and talking about them behind their back. It says, Whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him a lying tongue, hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Turn, if you would, please, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to see this here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, this, this has a tendency to be more of a problem among the ladies. Now, that doesn't mean that men don't do this. So it's not like men are off the hook. This, is, this, is, this applies to everybody. It's the same truth. It's the same knowledge. It's the same wisdom. 
it's the same thing that God hates no matter who does it but for whatever reason ladies have a more natural tendency to do these things and it's addressed specifically here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 11 the Bible reads but the younger widows refuse for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ they will marry having damnation because they have cast off their first faith and with all they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house and not only idle but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to adversary to speak reproachfully. So the advice that's given here for someone who's younger, a younger lady, if they are married and they got and, and their, their husband died, he's saying, you know what? What's best for them is that they just get married, bear children, guide the house. Why? Because it's gonna keep you busy. Because the problem here, the root was, look, they learn to be idle. They don't have enough work to do. They so when, when you find a lady that doesn't have enough work to do, that's not keeping herself busy, what's going to come naturally? Well, the sin nature is going to take over, and then it's going to be becoming... Uh, wandering from house to house because I got nothing to do. So I'm just going to go from house to house. And as I go from house to house, I'm going to learn this about this person and learn that about that person. And I'm going to start telling everyone else as I'm going house to house, I'm going to start tattling on these people. I'm going to start being a busybody and getting involved in other people's matters that are none of your business. It happens. If it didn't happen, it wouldn't be in God's Word. And that's why he's saying, look, get married, have children, get busy and keep yourself busy. Now look, if you don't have any children, if you're not that busy, do some, find a way to keep yourself occupied and keep yourself busy so that you as a lady don't fall into this trap of becoming a tattler and becoming a busybody and speaking things which you ought not to speak. It's a natural urge to try to get involved in other people's business. Look, I get it. That's why the soap operas are so popular, right? Because everyone, oh, there was all this love watching all this drama and all the problems are going on in everybody's life and you just get your eyes glued to that, to that drama. But it's, it's ungodly. It's wicked. You ought not to be involved in that nonsense. And ultimately what it does is it drives wedges between families, between people, and between the church. Turn, if you would, please, to Proverbs chapter 25, because the Bible has the answer. Besides here of just keeping yourself busy so you, know, so you don't fall into that type of a trap as a lady, Proverbs 25, no matter who you are, gives us how we are supposed to respond when confronted. Because think about it. If someone is a busybody, if someone's a tattler, if someone's a whisperer, if someone is doing these things to sow discord... It's not just them involved. It could also be you, right? They're the ones that's doing it. They're the ones that's bringing it to you. But how you deal with it is also important. You say, I'm not a sower of discord. I don't busybody. I don't tattle. I don't spread rumors. Okay, but it may come to you one day. Here's how you deal with it. Look at verse number 23 of Proverbs 25. It says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. When someone comes to you with backbiting and starts talking trash about someone else, one of your friends or one of the church members, you know what it says you do? It says you give them an angry countenance. You give them a, a mean look, a dirty look. It says there, just like the north wind drives away that rain, it gets that rain out of there. You say, you give, that, you give that person just a mean, nasty, dirty look. I can't believe you're saying that to me. Why would you say that to me? You say, oh, but that might be rude. Oh, that might be uncomfortable. Yeah, you know what? But that's what God said that you ought to do. That's what Proverbs says you ought to do. Give them that angry look. And you ought to be angry about it that they're going to go and start trying to get you involved in business that's none of your business anyways, that they're going around and, and starting to talk, talk trash about people and sowing discord. I don't know about you, but it makes me, it'll make me pretty angry if I find out about someone trying to sow discord among the brethren here. That'll get me really upset. I don't want this church to split. I want everyone to be in unity and be in one place and in one accord and where everybody loves each other looking out for each other and is able to show forgiveness over the weaknesses and faults of your brethren. Proverbs 22.10 says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. It's the scornful person that, that, that starts all the contention to begin with. 
You say, you get rid of that person, the fighting will stop. And that's usually the case, too. Usually, you get, you get, I mean, one person can do a lot of damage. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You get one person in there going around and sowing discord. I mean, you could, if they're really good at what they're doing, if they're really wicked, they could go get pit everybody against everybody else. It happens. We don't want that to happen. Practice your mean look. Go to me. Get your angry countenance down so that way when it comes to you, you can just use it. And honestly, you say, yeah, but this person's a close friend of mine and I don't, you know, like I don't want to offend them. Look, this is more important that you're able to do what's right. Give them the angry countenance and do it out of love for them because, you know, oftentimes, you know, sometimes there is the wicked person and we're going to get to that person in just a minute that actually is coming in to intentionally sow discord and intentionally cause problems. But oftentimes, especially with the ladies, you know, it, 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 it's one of those things that I think isn't thought well through enough and may come as a result of being idle or may come as a result of something else and the gossip just starts. But even if that's the case, you say it's not really, you know, they're not trying to hurt anybody. I still think you should apply the, the, the angry countenance when the backbiting starts because it needs to stop. And we're all adults here. And I, I, I say this time and time again. I love going to a church or hearing preaching from anybody where they don't hold back. I'm a big boy. I could take it. Okay? If there's truth to be told and if I'm just doing completely the wrong thing, don't, don't, don't spoon feed me like a little child. Lay it all out on the table. There it is. Wow, I'm doing all of that. Okay, that's up to me to handle that. Don't feel like you have to be real soft with people, especially in this instance. I mean, the Bible says an angry countenance is going to drive away that backbiting tongue. It's going to make it stop. Let's just have that faith. And you know, if that person, you know, maybe they get offended right away. But hopefully what happens is they can go back and, and realize, well, maybe for them to do that reaction to me, a close friend, maybe I did do something wrong. I'll get them to think as opposed to more of just going along with what they're saying and kind of reinforcing the bad behavior. You need to be able to stop this stuff. And uh, according to the way the Bible says, right here, when you hear the backbiting tongue about somebody, you know, give the angry countenance and cause it to cease. Turn, if you would, to the book of Jude. It's our memory passage, the book of Jude. Right near the end of the Bible there, right before the book of Revelation. The second to last book of the Bible is the book of Jude. <laughs> Now we're going to start looking at people who come in, who will come into churches, and it is intentional. And they will deliberately try to sow discord. Abigail, pay attention. They will deliberately try to sow discord among the brethren, and these people will be sneaky about it. And it will happen. That's my first point. Look at Jude, uh, verse number 3. Bible reads, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's warning them. He's saying, look, I wrote unto you and I gave diligence to write unto you the common salvation. And you need to contend for that faith. Why? Because there's men that have already crept in. There's men that crept in unawares. They flew in under the radar. You didn't realize it at first, but they crept in. They snuck in to your congregation, into your group. And it says they were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They're ungodly men, wicked people that are coming in. It says turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The outward, but how do they do this? The outward appearance is they'll say the things that you want to hear to gain your trust and to get in and to creep in unawares. But in their heart, this is what they believe and ultimately they're there to destroy. 
Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude are parallel passages. It's basically the same doctrine, the same things being covered. So if you haven't done this before, I recommend taking 2 Peter 2 and Jude and just studying them side by side and kind of reading through both of them. And you'll see all the similarities and get to get a good idea of what both of these chapters are talking about here with false prophets and reprobates. And, um, but anyways, look at verse number 1 of 2 Peter chapter number 2. It starts off basically the same way that Jude starts off. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So the Bible's saying here, he said, Look, there's going to be false prophets among you. It's going to happen. There shall be. And it says they're privily, which would be like privately, they're secretly bringing in their damnable heresies. They're secretly bringing in these perverted false doctrines to try to infect the whole church with that false doctrine. And it says in verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. It says and they're going to gather people after them. It happens. And it's usually the weaker people, the people who are weak in the faith. That's why it says later, here, look at verse number 13. It says, and shall receive the reward. It goes, it goes on and on about the false prophet and all these other things. So read the whole chapter. But we're going to jump down to verse 13. It says, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Again, trying to just drive home the fact that there's men that are crept in unawares. They're coming in. They, 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 there shall be false teachers among you. They're private bringing in their damnable heresies and they do all these things while they feast with you. They're sitting down next to you at the table having good fellowship and fun and, you know, and, and eating that meal with you. It says in verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. And it goes on and on from there. These wicked, false prophet reprobates that sneak into the churches, you know what they go after? They go after the unstable souls. They don't attack the person who's founded and grounded and they've been here for years and they know the Bible and if you try to bring them any word of false doctrine, they're going to rebuke you and say, no, that is not what the Bible says, thus saith the Lord. Because that's too hard of a target. They're not going to be able to, to, to impact that person. So what they do is they go after the unstable souls. They go after maybe the new believer. Maybe someone who just got saved out soul winning and they just started coming to church. They're going to hone in on that person and try to infect them and try to get them and say, oh no, yeah, hey, great, you got saved, but you know what? This is what the Bible really says. They'll go after the unstable souls, the children. They'll go after the unstable souls, just anybody who's not founded in their faith. Even if they're not a new believer, but they've just never really been fed, they never really got in their Bible, they never really grew that much, and they don't know much about the Bible, those are the people that are going to be led away by these false prophets, and they're going to be deceived. And it's going to happen. And he's warning us here, he's warning us over and over again, look, these wicked people are going to come into your church, and they're going to try to draw people away, and they're going to come in, and they're going to feast with you, and they're going to have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, and they're going to be among you. Now, that doesn't mean we need to go on a witch hunt and start looking at each other and saying, is it you? Yeah, the Bible says they're going to be with us. Is it you? No. Jesus even let one of the reprobates in his ministry, Judas Iscariot, the traitor, right? He allowed him to be there. Jesus knew who he was, but no one else did. I mean, remember at the Last Supper when they're saying, when he said that someone was going to betray him, and, he, and everyone's like, is it me? See, they didn't know. They didn't, they didn't point to, they weren't poking each other saying, I bet it's Judas. They had no idea. They, they didn't know so much that they just said, I, I mean, Judas would never do that. Is it me? I mean, am I going to do that? That's how much they trusted him. That's how much he was in their group. And that is the way, that is the perfect example of the false prophet, of the, of the reprobate that gets in, the wicked man that could get in unnoticed. 
And we just need to be aware of this, aware that these people exist. And this is the type of person, though, who is bent on causing destruction and causing dissemblance. And I mean, that's what Judas did, right? He broke up what Jesus was starting. That was his intention. He got Jesus arrested. And Jesus was leading the group, right? So he attacked Jesus Christ and tried to... And obviously we know there's, there's a much greater plan involved with that and everything else. But when you, if you try to look at it through the eyes of Judas or whoever, you know, he was delivering them unto the, unto the Pharisees to, to be arrested and to, and to quit that ministry. Sowing discord through heresy can split churches and it definitely can cause division. So you'll watch out for the people that are going to come in and try to just um, just split a church. Now, I just recently had a conversation with somebody uh, looking for a church in an, in an area, and they were looking for um, a, you know, a good King James Bible-believing church that also was uh, believed in post-trib rapture. And I kind of laughed a little bit because <laughs> I was like, well, good luck. You know, there's not a whole lot of them out there. And I was trying to give advice to this person and because um, and, this is what I believe. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to believe every single thing that I say. I don't expect you to, okay? We can have some differences in, in how we view different aspects of Scripture, but fundamentally they ought to be the same. We ought to have the same beliefs. We ought to be in unity on, on the fundamentals for sure. But I don't consider the timing of the rapture a fundamental, hardcore doctrine that like, you know, if you don't have this right, then I can't, I can't be a part of your church. So what I recommended to this person was just that, you know, you're probably not going to find one. Honestly, you're, you're probably not. But you'll probably find plenty of other really good churches that love the Lord, that have salvation, right, that do souling, that use the King James Bible. And those are the things that are most important. And the Bible says, you know, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be getting into church. Be a part of these church. And I said, but when you do, don't be someone who's going to go around and start, hey, you need to see this documentary. Hey, and, and start bringing up what you believe about the rapture, even though, hey, I believe what it's, that's true. I believe the post rapture, you know, but don't be this person who's going to go around the church now and try to tell everybody else why what the pastor's teaching is wrong. You need to hear this because what that's going to do is sow discord. And again, we're not talking about a salvation doctrine. We're not talking about, you know, a, a, a fundamental of the faith. We're talking about something else. But, you know, and, and if there's a fundamental difference, like you think you believe in work salvation, then go join yourself to a church that believes in work salvation. You don't need to go around and start trying to, to sow discord among the people who already have their, you know, their faith in that. Um, so there's ways that even, even a well-intentioned person can be sowing discord. And you, we don't want to be involved in split. I mean, you guys just came from a church where you had different beliefs from everyone else. But I believe you handled it the right way. I mean, you weren't going around and trying to convince everybody else why they're wrong and why you're right and just, and just making a big deal out of it. Now, that being said, if someone were to approach you and bring up the subject, you, you could obviously answer what you believe. There's no reason to lie to people. And if they're interested in it, you could talk to them and give them evidence. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But there's a difference between, between that happening and you intentionally going around to try to convert people into a different belief than what's being taught in the church. If you feel that strongly about that doctrine, the best way to handle that is to humbly and meekly approach the pastor, the leadership of the church, and bring it up to them because that's the person who you're going to want to, that's the person who's leading it and trying to keep the unity, who's going to need to be able to teach that, you know, a difference in doctrine maybe anyways. That's the right way to deal with it within a church. It's not for you to just go around and start bringing it up to everyone else. Where, where are you? Are you in First Peter, Second Peter 2? Yes. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 3. Let's go backwards a little bit. Titus chapter 3. That was a little bit of a, of a sidestep from where I was at. What we saw earlier from the false prophet is, is someone bringing in damnable heresy. 
and, and I kind of segued into something that's not a damnable heresy, but something we shouldn't be doing anyways. But the damnable heresies can definitely split the church as you start getting people confused about um, you know, salvation or whatever. And people will do that. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse number 9, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic... After the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Now, I have typically, you know, read this verse and looked at this and applied it in, in a manner uh, like when you're giving the gospel to people and you're soul winning to just say, hey, you know, if someone's just a total heretic, you give them a couple opportunities, but then reject them. But I think this applies also, maybe even more so, in a context of within the church where he says avoid foolish questions and genealogies and these contentions you know if someone just is, is coming up to you and just you know asking you a bunch of foolish questions and having strivings about the law and, and, and really just wanting to fight over this stuff it says that's unprofitable and fain you shouldn't you know one way to, for you to prevent it is just not even get involved with that just, yeah, I don't really want to talk. I'm not really interested in that. Someone just wants to bring a fight to you over genealogies and over these strivings about the law and stuff. Just say, you know what? Yeah, that's fine. And then, because and then, then it goes on to say a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So if someone just comes to you with false doctrine, try to show them. Say, you know what? No, what you're believing is false. You know? And you show them once and you show them twice. But if they're not going to receive it, it says you reject that person. You know? And, um, but we do have to be aware of the heretic, of the person that might come in, just trying to sow discord among the brethren. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, where Paul was writing where there was problems and divisions among the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 reads, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. He said, you guys have divisions among the church. He said, you should have unity, but, I, but there's division. I hear that there's divisions. He says, and I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So the reason why he's believing what he's hearing about there being division is because, there's, well, there's got to be heresy then. When there's, when there's divisions within the church, then there's got to be heresies. Someone is sowing that discord and teaching this false doctrine within the church to where you got people split. And it's sad, but I've, I've actually seen churches where, you know, some, or I've heard of them, excuse me, I haven't seen them. I can't say that, that I've witnessed it with my own eyes. I have heard firsthand accounts of people that said, you know what? I went to a church where about half the church believed salvation was completely by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. It's only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then there was another faction, another half of the church that believed, well, no, you actually have to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. You actually have to turn away from doing sin in order to be saved. And he said, like, that was split. There's a split church over that. And I agree. I mean, yeah, you should be split over that. That is a doctrine to split over. But what's sad is that the church got to the point to where that even became a problem. You know, it ought not to ever even get to that point. Hopefully you could find the person who's spreading the damnable heresies and get them out of there before it ever gets to the point to where now all of a sudden half the church is believing in a works-based salvation the other half believe is, is saved. It believes in, in salvation by grace. The, the heresies that come in will, will, uh, will do that. And, and you know, it's funny, we were just talking about this while we we're out soul winning too, how, how uh, Brother Robert was telling me what a great job that Pastor Jimenez does of dealing with these types of problems specifically from the pulpit. He says, as soon as he hears about this stuff coming up, he deals with it right away. And look, that's one of the great things about being in an independent church. Something that's completely independent. We don't have a set of rules or a doctrine that we have to say that we believe in or else so-and-so other organization is going to cut us off. This is the authority for this church. Amen. It's found in this book. Now, there are other great churches that love the Lord and, and, and are doing great works and they say the same thing, 
and maybe there's a difference of, of belief there. That's fine. And you know what? You might follow other people and you might have different beliefs. That's fine. But in this church, what is being taught here is not going to be, you know, I'm not going to allow for people to just go around and start spreading other doctrines just, just throughout the church. Like I said before, it's kind of nefariously going around and spreading doctrines that is contrary to what is being taught here. Ephesians 4, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there in, um, well, I'm going to jump up and read even before that. Verse number 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, and I, and I have this highlighted in my Bible because I actually use these verses. We run into people sometimes that just say like, oh, I don't need church. Uh, and, and you know what? For salvation, they're right. You don't need church to be saved. You need Jesus Christ to be saved. That's true. But the people that say, you know what? Like we ran a guy, oh, I'll just do a Bible study. That's funny. So you're just kind of ignoring what the gifts that God's given unto men, where he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. I'm sorry, do you have a, do you have a pastor of your Bible study? Do you have an ordained elder of your Bible study? Why is it that, that the, the Bible goes through the criteria of someone who could even hold that position if it doesn't even matter? I don't need to go. I don't like church. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to church. Usually the root problem with someone like that is because they don't want any man to rule over. They don't want to be sitting underneath somebody else and learning. Right. It's because they're proud and they're lifted up in themselves. But this is, I mean, I show this to people because, hey, this isn't, church is important. It is important. It's, it's important for the perfecting of the saints. Hey, you're saved. Praise the Lord. You're sanctified. But let's perfect you now. Let's go on. Let's, let's keep moving forward. It doesn't end at salvation. Your life begins at salvation. Amen. It begins with that new creature. You're born again. You're a child. Now let's grow together. Let's, let's do the great works of God. And you know where it's going to happen? It's going to happen in a good church. And a church is a congregation. We're going to have other like-minded believers there edifying you and helping you along the way and helping to guide you and helping to teach you and being there for you. Church is way more. And hey, you're going to come and learn some stuff too by the, by the man of God that's the pastor or the teacher that God has put there to help you, to teach you, to grow. That's one of the things you get there, but that's not all you get. Right. It's getting to know the people. It's, it's, it's the edification from everybody within the church. The Bible says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. There ought to be a unity of the faith here within this body. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. See, what happens with children? They're tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay and wait to deceive. There are people out there trying to deceive you. It's that, I mean, how many more warnings do we need to see that this is happening? And they're going after the unstable souls. They're going after the children, the spiritual children that are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because they don't, they're not founded yet. They're not grown. They don't quite know what to believe. This is all new to them. The, the blinders have just been taken off of their eyes. Now they can start reading the Bible and starting to comprehend it. But the Bible is a big book. And there's people who are really adept at taking a verse or two out of context and just saying, see, look. Look what the Bible says. And a, a, a child who doesn't know any better will say, will say, well, I believe the Bible, and if that's what it says, then I believe it. But they're being led astray. They're being tossed around with every wind of doctrine. That's why they're easier to deceive.
We need to make sure as, as a church we can have the unity of faith. Watch out for the person bringing in the heresies. And hey, we all need to grow and make sure that we're not children. We're not spiritual children. I don't think anyone is in this church. Thank, you know, praise God. But um, you know, we don't want to be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. That is how they get churches to split. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of churches, they're not, they're not teaching the good doctrine. It's kind of just a fluff, fluff sermon and not really going deep and getting into the teaching and explaining why this is what we believe, what we believe, and using you know, a lot of scripture. That's why, you, if you haven't noticed, we don't, we don't read one verse and then I get up here and flap my gums for an hour. We get into the Word because that's where the truth is and that's what everybody needs to be grounded in. Now, I'm gonna, I've got some examples listed here of uh, someone sowing discord. So now, we're kind of taking a step back. That was what we just saw. There's, there's, there's kind of two types of people that can sow discord. There's one that would consider more of a of an unintentional sower of discord and the intentional sower of discord. There's people who kind of get caught up in that, that, that aren't really truly in their heart meaning to really do what they're doing. And there's people that do. So here's some examples of, um, you know, a sower of discord is the opposite of someone that's edifying. And we saw in Ephesians chapter 4, it's, you know, the church is for edification. And what is edifying? It's building people up. So when you esteem others better than yourself, like was the mind of Christ, he esteemed others better than himself, your goal, your vision, your thinking with those people is you want to build them up. John the Baptist was saying, you know, he must increase, but I must decrease. We talk about Jesus' ministry. His job was to point people to Christ. It wasn't there for his own glory and his own ministry and his own, you know, like his own accolades and his own recognition. No, he esteemed Christ better than himself. So he said, my job is just to build, hey, however it can be, if I have to go to prison for it, whatever I have to do, if it's going to help to build people up and bring them to Christ, then that's what I'm going to do. And we need to have that same type of an attitude. Someone who's sowing discord is not focused on helping that person out or lifting them up or edifying them. They're more bringing them down. Well, let's say a brother does you wrong and if no one else is involved, there's no reason to tell everyone about it. I mean, even if you're right and they're wrong, a brother in Christ just comes and does you wrong. Just flat out, unmistakable, does you wrong. There's no reason to go around then and tell everybody about that. Amen. At least not right at first. Okay, there's, de there's ways, and we went through this through the whole um, process of dealing it with it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, I'll read it for you here. I've got it in my notes. I didn't even realize I put it in here. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible reads, But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there's utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? He's saying, you know, the type of attitude that you ought to have if your brother in Christ does you wrong, he said, why don't you just, just suffer it, just deal with it? You know, God will see that. God will make sure everything gets right anyways. That's right. Just, just be, be the person that's in spiritual growth enough to be able to say, fine. If that's the way they're going to be, and that's wrong, and that's wicked, so be it. I'll allow it to happen. I'm not going to make a big deal of it. I'm not going to make a big fuss out, out of it. I'll just allow myself to, to take the wrong. I'll allow myself, and you know what? Because what's going to happen to them? You know, God, they're a child of God too. God will deal with them. Right. It's just like my, uh, you know, my, the, the, my girls, they don't need to worry about you know, themselves disciplining each other. They don't need to worry about if, if, if Abigail does wrong to Elizabeth. Elizabeth doesn't need to do anything against Abigail because guess what? Dad's going to take care of it. Right. And that punishment is going to be enough <laughs> to cover whatever the wrong that was done. She'll be taken care of. That's fine. She doesn't need to get involved. And, and us as you know, brethren... We don't need to be getting involved. Hey, if one of your brothers in Christ, your sister in Christ, does something to wrong you, let the Heavenly Father take care of it and just, just suffer to be happened. And don't let it become such a problem to where you just got to tell everyone about it and then get everybody you know, against that person. Right. There's no purpose for that. 
And you know, in 1 Corinthians 6, it also tells the way that we do handle problems. Look, if you do have a problem, you just feel like you, you can't get over it and you need to deal with the problem, then the way you first do it is you approach the person and try to deal with it, with it just between you and them alone. Nobody else, no backbiting, no gossiping. Between you and them alone, try to get the problem resolved. If that doesn't work, the Bible says you get one or two witnesses. So that at the mouth of one or two witnesses, every word should be established. Hey, this is the problem. This person wronged me. And you got two people sitting there and they could help just establish everything that was said and done. And if that still doesn't work, that low level resolution, then you bring it before the church. And the church is going to decide and say, they're going to hear the matter and say, this is the judgment of the church and that the people who have the problem need to deal with it and accept whatever judgment comes from the church. And that should be the end of it. If it even gets to that point, he's saying here, don't even let it get to that point. Just, just suffer wrong. Just allow it to happen. But like I said, if you can and it gets to that point, then whatever happens comes out, whether you're ruled in favor of or in favor of against, that's it. And that's where it needs to stop. Because when it, when it goes further than that, it's wickedness. And you have to start talking and gossiping and telling other people and, and you cause these divisions. That's sowing discord. And as I mentioned before, you know, if someone, if someone commits a sin against you, um, or, or excuse me, a brother in Christ commits a sin, now it's not against you, but if they commit a sin and you find out about it, Right? Somehow, for whatever reason, you find out what they did. If it's not a major sin that would require, you know, the church, hey, you know, this guy's you know, doing something really seriously wrong, then there's no reason to talk about it. Because all that's going to be doing, again, that's sowing discord. Proverbs 17, verse 9. That's, you could turn if you want. It's the last place we're going to turn. I have no more scripture references. Almost done here. Just wrapping it up. Proverbs 17, verse 9. Proverbs 17, 9 reads, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So you're saying if you're able to just cover a transgression, overlook it like it didn't happen, he says you seek love, right? But when you repeat a matter, when you bring it up and say, oh, I saw this, and now you're repeating it to other people, right. you're bringing up this transgression, it says that separates very friends. Right. And what's the purpose of that? That's definitely not for the use of edification, that's for sure. My last point here for... for Sowing discord is one that I'm sure we're all in agreement here anyways, is that, and we've seen this, Satan has sown discord among many of the churches with the modern perversions of the Bible. You talk about a perfect example of sowing discord. See, there used to be unity when everybody used the same Bible, when there was only one Bible to use. That's unity. And see, people will, will, will complain about the KJV only movement. Oh, you're so divisive. Oh, you cause so much problems. Actually, we want unity. We say, throw out all this other nonsense that causes confusion. Right. Because one guy, well, my Bible says this. Well, my Bible says this. Well, that's not even in my Bible. That's confusing. Right. I say, let's have one book because there's one word of God, because God is not uh, schizophrenic. God does not have just, just saying, you know, talking out of both sides of his mouth. God said what he said. We have it recorded for us. It's been preserved as God promised in his word. We have it in 2016. And um, all these other versions, all they do is sow discord among the brethren. And it causes room for fights and damnable heresies and everything else to creep in as a major source of uh, discord. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these uh, instruction and wisdom from the book of Proverbs, and especially from this, this, uh, these few verses that we've been studying over the past few weeks on the things that you hate, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to have the right heart to be able to hate the same things that you hate, dear Lord.
and that we wouldn't get soft spots for these things, and that, but we'd be able to deal with them appropriately. Lord, this is a serious problem that, that many churches face, and I pray that we don't ever have to, but, but most likely we will, where people will try to come in and split our church and sow discord and try to get us pitted and fighting against one another instead of serving together uh, uh, with a common goal, dear Lord. I pray that you please help me as a pastor to watch over this flock and to help, help me to be able to spot the... Um, the false prophets and the wicked people that, that try to creep in unawares, dear Lord. And I pray that you please strengthen every one of the, the members that would be able to um, spot the heretic right away instead of being children that are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Dear Heavenly Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.